WWE Friday Night Smackdown was live at the Kia Center in Orlando, Florida. And here's my review. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Alex's World of Safe Space. It's like you. I'm your host, Alex. Just Alex. This is my review of the, I think, the August 16th edition of Friday Night Smackdown. A day later, better late than never. My apologies for not going live for either show this week. I just got home from a vacation, and I told myself, let me just give myself the week off. I did one live stream for AEW, and that's because we're coming up to AEW All In. Starting next week, we're back full swing. All live streams, WWE, AEW, pay-per-views, all that. And it's going to be a busy few months because there's a lot, a lot of shows that require me to review them. So you might want to strap in, and you also might want to subscribe. But not wasting your time. SmackDown. I haven't been the biggest fan of the show, SmackDown, over the last, dare I say, few months, post-WrestleMania. It's just been a very cold show. And Raw, it's had its off weeks here and there, but for the most part, Raw has been on fire. The storytelling, the characters, the excitement. It's such an engaging show from all aspects. Tag teams, women's division, men's, mid-card, top of the card, undercard even. And so when I compare SmackDown to Raw, it's actually kind of surprisingly disappointing. Like, it's the same company. It's literally the same writers, Triple H and Co., Triple H and Company, writing both shows. Why is one show doing better than the other? Is it because SmackDown has younger talent? Is more of a, I don't want to say NXT-centric show, because that's not true. Raw has NXT talent as well. I mean, Brian Breaker is an NXT talent. He's killing it. I don't know. It's just SmackDown has been missing something. This week, I feel like we started, we're starting to see more of that excitement, that engagement that we got, that we get from Monday Night Raw. Because we're starting to see more development in the characters and stories are starting to come more into focus. And that's good. You want that. But it is very alarming when you look at the difference in quality between both shows. This one in particular, this week in particular, what I really liked about it was that we advanced most of what we saw tonight. There were a couple of things in there that I'm still kind of like, what are we doing here? But before I get into that, I want to start things off with a discussion that I inadvertently began on my Raw review, and I continued it throughout the week, and that was about Cody Rhodes. I asked the question, I think on Tuesday or Wednesday, I asked the question, do you believe Cody Rhodes is stale, has gotten stale as champion already, like four months in, right? And the voting, I did a poll on the YouTube community tab, got a lot of interaction, I think. As of right now, I think it's like 1,600. Yes, yeah, 1,600 votes, and it's still going. So you can still vote on it. 67% of you said no. He's not stale. Okay. I think a lot of fans are still invested in Cody as a champion. And why wouldn't they be? Again, I want to make this clear to everybody. I don't hate Cody. Matter of fact, I, I appreciate him as both an on-screen and off-screen talent. I think the dude is great at what he does. He's one of the best performers of the generation. And whether I like him or not, which I do, I do like him, he is someone that fans and people inside the business look up to. He is a role model. He is someone people strive to be. You don't get that a lot. And I think that's why ultimately people aren't tired of Cody yet. His aura is unmatched. He is someone that, okay, if I want to make someone a world champion, that's who I would pick. He carries himself like a champion. He's great at media. The guy is what John Cena was to kids back when I was growing up. That's what Cody Rose is now. So it's hard for me to argue against people that say, I don't think he's stale. I guess where I was coming from 
was a television, purely a television character standpoint. When I look at Kogi's reign as the WWE Champion, it's only been four months, but post-WrestleMania, I'm sorry, it's not that interesting. Matter of fact, if I was to put a word to it, it's underwhelming. And people haven't given me their excuses to why it hasn't been working. Because even though, and it's funny, even though people say Cody Rhodes isn't stale as a champion, they then, if you look at the comments, they then go on to say, we agree his championship reign isn't all that interesting. So there's a happy medium there. They believe he's good. He's definitely someone that should be the champ. He's the man. But there's something off. Whether it's the booking, whether it's his opponents, whether it's his character, whatever it is. Something is off about Cody's reign. Me, personally, I don't think it's his opponents. AJ Styles, Kevin Owens. Look, Logan Paul, even though that was very random and for some reason didn't work out as much as I thought it would. Come on, Logan Paul and Cody Rhodes, that's a match made in heaven. I would have thought that would have been like a Survivor Series SummerSlam match, but... It was very, very bland. Almost non-existent. If I didn't bring it up, I bet some of you even forgot he fought Logan Paul in Saudi Arabia, right? Crazy. But still, like, Logan Paul's a heat magnet. And then Solo Sokoa, yes, I do agree that Solo... Put it to you this way. Solo Sokoa is that new quarterback that someone brought in that the coaches bring in, and they said, listen... This guy has a lot of promise. He has a lot of potential. It's his first year in, and you're like, he's not really doing much. But as time goes by, you're starting to see, okay, there's some things in there that's working. I think solo on the microphone is a lot better than I thought. Even I'm sitting here like, he is good at generating heat as a, as a talker on the microphone. Inside the ring? Uh, uh, needs, needs some work. He's very bland. As an in-ring worker. You get what I mean? He's not the full package in terms of a main event player. He still needs some work. A lot of work. But even still, they're building him up very, very well. And I would think he would at least do something with Cody. And I'm sorry that SummerSlam match wasn't all that great. But you take Solo away and put him with Roman, it's hot. This is great. It's a natural story, yes, but it's still awesome. And I compare Cody's reign to Roman's reign. See what I did there? Roman, when he first, let's say when he won the championship back as a heel in 2020, who was his first opponent? It wasn't Edge, wasn't Brian Danielson, wasn't John Cena, wasn't Brock Lesnar, it wasn't Cody Rhodes. It was Jay Uso. Before he became Mr. Yeet, it was Jay Uso. And even now, that's one of his best feuds. One of his best matches ever is that Hell in a Cell match with Jey Uso. Because Roman brings interest to his feuds, to his opponents. Something Cody has yet to do as champion. As, as champion, babyface champion to be more exact, he's yet to do that. And I think people hear me say that and think, you hate Cody Rhodes. Again, it's, it's nothing to do with how I feel about the talent, the performer. I'm talking mostly about when I turn on my TV and he's on my screen, what he's doing is just not interesting. What Roman did, what Roman is doing, is still the most interesting thing about WWE. His feud with the, the new bloodline is carrying SmackDown. And so people need to understand when I say that. I'm not saying it to discourage, to disparage Cody. I'm saying it because that's what I see and that's how I feel. And I think people are looking at Cody with rose-tinted glasses right now. And as time goes by, when the honeymoon period ends, it's a little bit longer. Well, no. I think we're about to come to the end of it. But I'll give it into Survivor Series. Probably around November, December. When the rose-tinted glasses come out and we get into next year. That's going to be a real test. That's if they don't develop his character, and that's also considering they don't take the belt off of him. Because I'm thinking they might take the belt off of him right before he gets stale. 
Although I feel like he's already kind of getting there. But again, people disagree. 67% say he's a great champion. He's awesome to watch. And I'm not going to disagree with you. I can't argue against that. I understand. I just think, even with this view with, uh, with Kevin Owens, and we'll start with that, because on this particular show, Kevin Owens fought Grayson Waller, and Kevin backstage was hearing Grayson Waller talk about how much of a loser he is. You've lost basically all your matches over the last... It's, it's been a minute since he won a singles match. It's been a minute. You've lost all your matches. You've failed all your opportunities, against the bloodline especially. Why are you being handed a championship? At least a championship opportunity. You know what I mean? And I think that's an interesting story from the standpoint of, one, it's accurate, but also how Kevin is reacting to it. Kevin knows. He's acknowledging it. Yeah, I shouldn't be in this spot, but you're putting me there, so I guess I better bring back that old... Kevin Owens, Kevin Steen, that old Kevin Owens that made people go, yes, I was a champion. Because he's remembering what he had to do, the person he was when he was the Universal Champion, when he became the NXT Champion, when he became a champion. He wasn't the Kevin Owens now. He was a much more dangerous, vicious one. And I said last week, I think what's going to happen is that now they're forcing Kevin into a spot that's going to force him to change who he is and bring out a side of him that he doesn't like. That to me, makes him interesting. Is he going to turn heel? We need more heels, right? That's something else people have been saying about Cody. We don't have enough heels. Kevin as a heel would be fantastic. And I know we're going to turn Randy heel. That one, we all see coming. Randy's going to lose to Gunther. He'll come back to SmackDown, disgruntled, disparaged, uh, feeling down on himself. And he'll want to find that Viper. He'll, he'll get... He'll get the, the sensation to be that snake that he's always been. And he'll eventually turn heel. We see that coming. With Kevin, though, I have to think there isn't much for him to do as a babyface. And following this view with Cody, and he's not going to be Cody. Let's just get that straight. What are you going to do with him? You're just going to keep him as Cody's friend? I think it would be better if we sent him off into a different direction altogether. I'm not saying make him a heel. You can make him a tweener, dare I say, Stone Cold Steve Austin kind of person that kind of goes against everybody. Heels and baby faces. Because that's what I remember about Kevin Steen in Ring of Honor. He wasn't a heel or a face. We'll have to see what they do. I would hate for Cody to beat Kevin and then he just goes right back to being his friend. That just, it just defeats the purpose of this whole thing. Why even why even go here if there's nothing to come out of it? When Jay Uso got into that feud with Roman, he got elevated from it. I would like Kevin to at least come across, at least feel like someone important. Because that didn't happen with AJ Styles. As great as their matches were, AJ Styles feels like nothing after that feud with Cody. He feels like nothing. And Solo didn't get anything out of Cody. But he'll get something out of Roman. He's already He already feels like a legit, um, a, a better, formidable uh, threat with Roman around. Now, he, it's because of his, you know, his bloodline, of course. Uh, having Jacob Fott, too, also does help. But we'll talk about Solo in a second. I like what they're doing with Nia Jax. I find her to be a much more, there's that word again, interesting champion. Oh, she's a lot more interesting than Bailey. I don't know what they were doing with Bailey. Again, when you look at what they're doing with Liv Morgan on Monday Night Raw, holy shit, it's like night and day. How can we get what we're getting with Rhea Ripley and Liv Morgan and then turn on SmackDown and we get a nothing rain with Bailey? Literally nothing. Now, Nia Jax, I'm not saying that she's going to have this extraordinarily amazing rain either. Because right now, the people involved aren't doing it for me. She's around pretty deadly. And then we got Tiffany Stratton, who is, I don't know what they're doing with her either. It feels like they want to turn her babyface. They're setting her up as someone to take the belt off of Nia Jax, which could, I guess, by default, turn her babyface. 
and they're setting her up with Chelsea Green, who's a heel. So it's weird. You can see them trying to paint or at least getting ready to send her in that direction. I mean, it could work. Fans already like Tiffany Stratton. I just kind of feel like with her character now, it isn't really a babyface character. The way Tiffany is now. Can we find one for her later? Okay, but I don't see it working out. I don't see it working out as much as I would like it to. She might have to change a few things. They might have to develop a some type of a story, a new character all, the, all together to make this work. But this championship royal cor coronation where they have Nia Jax coming out being carried out like a queen and she's doing the uh that the pageant wave is is really fun again like she's a lot more interesting as champion than bailey was and they're already teasing this whole idea that tiffany could turn on her because naya's telling tiffany to bow and then they did this musical with pretty deadly and i get it pretty deadly is supposed to be cringy on purpose they're the the fodder uh heels that purposely get beat up they're supposed to be jokes and they're good at their role, but it's too good because it's annoying the hell out of me. They had Mia Yim, or Mi Jan, I'm calling her Mia Yim, go out there to attack Nia Jax and Tiffany and Pretty Deadly. And that's the feud, that's the match for the upcoming pay-per-view, Fashion Berlin. Sure, whatever. As long, again, like with Kevin Owens, there's something to come out of it for Mia Yim. I've been waiting waiting on them to do something with Mia. And the crazy thing about Mia, she's in the best shape of her career. She has never looked this bad. She's always looked great in terms of, you know, she's a good-looking woman. And, of course, she has a great look. Uh, I just feel like the way she looks now, in terms of her in-ring performance, in terms of how she carries herself, in terms of how she moves, in terms of her, in terms of her presentation, this is the best she's ever looked. And so I'm waiting for Triple H and Creative to give her something. I'm not looking for a Bronson Reed type of push, which, again, you look at what they're doing with Braun Breaker and Bronson Reed, and you go, what is happening with SmackDown? Where is this for SmackDown? You hear what I mean? Give me something for me again. Because it's lacking. And it's not just lacking with her. It's lacking with a lot of these women. I mean, Naomi had a match against uh, Bea Priestley, uh, Devin, uh, was it Davenport? Blair Davenport. Devin. It's Blair Davenport. But, you know, Bea Priestley. And the match was fine. I was watching the match, and I was just like, there's nothing about this that's connecting with me. I feel nothing. I feel nothing about this. Which is sad, because it's involving Naomi and Bea Priestley. This should be a hot thing. It's just not there. There's something missing. And so I'm waiting for them to give them something for me to chew on. Because you're doing this thing with Alba Fire and Isla Dawn, the, un the unholy union. Did I get that right? Unholy union. And they're taking on, of course, Triple H's favorites and my favorites as well. Jay Cargill and Bianca Belair. And that's going to be a feud I'm assuming that's going to lead into Survivor Series. And I'm pretty sure they'll get the belts back then. That's fine. That's fine. There's no heat to it. It's very lacking. And hopefully something comes along and makes me interested in what they're doing. Because the women's division on SmackDown, it, it's not doing it for me. Raw, completely different story. Rhea and Liv are definitely lighting the world on fire. But that's, you know, maybe that's a... That's just my taste. I just prefer what they're doing with them than I am with this. I don't know. You let me know. I will tell you some things I did like because I've been talking negative about SmackDown. Let me talk about something I do like. What they're doing with Carmelo Hayes and Andrade. Listen, you can see it. You know they want to do a best of seven series. And I'm sitting here like that's so perfect. So Carmelo Hayes is like, he's like an NBA basketball player turned wrestler. Not really. But that's the, that's the perception. He gives me that perception of like this NBA-esque performer. So when I think best of seven, it, it clicks. It connects with me. And I'm thinking, yeah, 
every time Andrade and Carmelo have a match, it gets better and better and better and better. And so I'm thinking, give it a best of seven series. Andrade goes up to Carmelo won one this week, and each of their matches have been bangers. This one, to me, has been the best one. And I think the next one's going to be better than this one, and then the one after that's going to be better than the next one, and then the seventh one will be their best. And I like that. And I think the winner should get a shot at L.A. Knight. Yeah! Carmelo, to me, is... When we talk about future world champions, when we talk about talent that could carry the shows, everyone goes to Braun Breaker. You should. Don't overlook Carmelo Hayes. This is a world champion. This guy has all the tools, the look, the way he carries himself, and the ability inside the ring. Once you get him to develop that right personality and give him the right story, within a good five or ten years, world champion for sure. Calling it now. But right now, we're building him up, and this feud with Andrade is perfect for both. And Andrade, Andrade's been needing something like this for the longest time because he came in, he was also cold. This is elevating both. So when we talk about elevating, when we talk about making things interesting, when we talk about getting me invested in what you're doing it's a simple story Andrade goes up on Carmelo Carmelo has a big ego he thinks he's better than what he really is but he he makes it very easy and actually enjoyable to see him get his ass kicked and so when he does win you're like god damn it now we gotta hear him gotta hear him talk that shit for a couple more weeks man I hope Andrade shuts him up it's a simple story but it works and so yes please Turn this into a best of seven series and let them just tear each other up because their matches are outstanding. You got my full interest with this. I like that the Street Profits beat DIY. And let me tell you why. So, first off, Street Profits, great tag team. Them and the Bloodline feel like a much more natural fit than uh, DIY and the Bloodline. DIY completely got destroyed by the Bloodline. And I think eventually they'll get their rematch, but they need to... Just like with other talent, they need to develop their team just a tad bit more. I like that they lost because part of the reason why they got over NXT was because they were the underdogs that lost more than they won. And when they won those titles, when they got a hold of a championship, they never held it for long. So now we're creating that feeling again on the main roster. Good. That's going to get Johnny and Ciampa over. And so what will end up happening is that they'll start to fall into their roles more. As they lose more, Gargano will stay the same. He'll become much more hopeful. He'll get that grit. He'll get that babyface spirit. And Ciampa will get desperate. He'll become that Sicilian... Uh, what was it again? I forgot what it was called. The Sicilia Slice, the Sicilian Killer. I forgot what it was called. Uh, some of y'all will tell me. I'm pretty sure I botched that. He'll become that heel he was on NXT. And I think when you get those dynamics working... That's when DIY becomes good again. Push that tag team. Get that to um to the mainstream. Get that to a level where people will want to see it. Um, people are going to go, so you're going to rehash what you, did, what you did on NXT? If it still works, why not? And to be fair, um, I still think there's a lot we can do with these guys. It does kind of remind me of Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, where it's just like, Jesus Christ, we can't get away from these guys. They're always together. Hey. When Sammy, and Kevin are, when Sammy and Kevin are together, they create magic, right? When Ciampa and Gargano are together, they create magic, so why not? Besides, if DIY was to have won this match, they would have lost to the Bloodline next week anyways. The Bloodline is going to crush, crush the Street Profits, who also need some type of a new direction. Now that Bobby's gone, we gotta do something with them as well. So I'm just waiting for... Triple H and Creative to find something for these guys to do. It's time now that we get things rolling on these talents. Like what they're doing with Giovanni Vinci. Loving this promo, by the way. His promo of him, I don't know what, what language it is, but he's a completely different person. He's wearing his glasses. He has a, a nice car. Uh, looks like high society, one percenter. Has women on his arm. Perfect. Perfect. And he's a great athlete. So it looks like they're setting him up as like a legit mid-card, maybe even pseudo-main event player. Sure, a great opponent for LA Knight. I'm here for it. I'm here for it. I think that would be great. So you're seeing some 
you're seeing some nuggets. The stuff with, like I said, the stuff with Carmelo Hayes and Andrade, what they're doing with Kevin Owens, perhaps potentially going heel. Uh, the things with, you know, Giovanni Vinci, the DIY. And that's just something small where it's just kind of like, all right, I can see what they want to do here. So let's see what they go with that. Uh, the women need a lot of work. Although I am intrigued more so about Nia Jax as champion than I was with Bayley. Uh, they need to work on the women's division altogether. LA Knight is going to be taking on Santos Escobar. Speaking of someone that has no interest, people think I'm down on Cody. You know who I'm really down on? Santos Escobar. Why? I'm sitting here like, okay, Triple H, man, let me talk to you. It's not working. You are pushing this guy, and you've been pushing Santos Escobar hard for a good two to three years. And he was pushing him hard on NXT. It ain't working. I'm not saying he's a bad dude. I've seen certain videos of him outside the ring. He's very articulate, very smart, great at media. I guess that's why they push him. Still, as an on-screen character, he is cold as ice. And no matter what you do with him, everything he's involved in brings down the program. He, he brings down the show. It doesn't work. I'm sorry, he doesn't work. What you want him to be, he's not going to be. When you get the Lucha Bros, Penta S. Cero Miedo or Pentagon Jr. and Bray Phoenix, they're going to be more so what you want them to be. Andrade already feels like what you want in a Mexican star. When Stephanie Baker comes up, she's going to be more of what you want in a, in a Mexican star. S Santos Escobar, to me, feels like that Triple H project that, Triple H project that he's just not going to give up on until he completely runs the, runs the wheels off of. It's, he's just going to keep riding it until the wheels fall off. Unfortunately, that's where we are with Santos Escobar. Because when I look at L.A. Knight and I see how massively over he is, I say they didn't, even have to, they didn't even have to try that hard with him. They did not have to try so hard with L.A. Knight. Look how naturally he just got over. They are trying everything with Santos Escobar. Everything. And it's just not working. So that's someone that just needs to go back to the drawing board. Send him back to NXT. And I mean it. He ain't working. I would rather they push Angel Garza, who has a lot more charisma. But all right, that's that's neither here or there. Main event was, of course, more Bloodline stuff. Why not? Just like what they did last week, Solo called out Roman. Roman came to the ring for the Umafala. Did I say that right? Umafala? The little... The... The Samoan beads, Okay. I'm pretty sure I said the actual name of it wrong, but the Samoan beads that they wear, which honestly carries more importance than the championship does. Sorry, did I piss you off when I said that? That the Umafala, the Samoan beads, feel, feel more important than the WWE championship? Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Let me know down below. Anyways, same thing what happened last week. Solo and... Tama, no Tonga, by the way. No Tonga Loa. It was just Tama Tonga and Roman, excuse me, Tama Tonga and Solo with Roman. And Roman just destroyed them both. And he goes to pick up the Samoan beads. And out of nowhere, here comes Jacob Fatu. And I even said last week, because people were worried that he injured himself. I'm like, he's fine. I saw him on social media walking around. He had a boot, but he's okay. And people were worried, like, man, he's going to be out for a long time. I'm like, I think he's fine. They're just letting him rest up because he did, I think he hit his shin. Whatever part of his foot got hit on that table dive. They're letting him recover from that before they have him wrestle. And so I was just sitting here like, I'm pretty sure he's okay. They're just keeping him off TV probably because they don't want him to get beat up by Roman. And he showed up last night and he annihilated Roman. He annihilated Roman. Because Roman was... Beating up Solo and Tonga completely destroyed them. But the moment Jacob got out there, the tie turned. I love that. What a way to keep him strong. That's what you want. You want Jacob Fatu to feel like a legit threat, a formidable opponent. That's how you do it. So to me, what they're probably going to do, and I hope they do this, they're going to have Solo versus Roman, probably at Bad Blood, and Roman will beat him. 
And so Solo already said, if Roman beats me, I will have to acknowledge Roman. And so will Tama, so will Tonga, and of course, Jacob. I think when Solo loses to Roman, Solo will acknowledge Roman, but the other three won't. They're not going to. And I think that's when Jacob Fatu takes over and it becomes a completely different, a completely different type of bloodline altogether. And that's when The Rock comes in. Oh, and that's when it gets really good. And then we get Rock. And maybe you can turn that into a, maybe that's your Survivor Series match right there. It's Rock and the new bloodline and Roman and of course Solo, Jimmy and Jay. So Civil War bloodline. Maybe you can do that at Survivor Series. I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't think they're going to do that because I also see them bringing in Hikaleo. So what will probably end up happening is that, and I'm spitballing here, when they do Roman versus Solo, Hikaleo will make his debut, and then Hikaleo will help Solo beat Roman, and then that will establish Solo legitimately as the, I would think, as the tribal chief, and then we'll do that until Rock comes in. And then we'll do Rock and Roman at that point. But um, yeah, I, I just feel like there's so much we can do with this based off of where we are with the feud. I liked this ending better than last week's. Last week's, Roman just killed them. And that was it. I'm like, oh. this is what we should have got last week. I think this is exactly what we should have gone. But I, I guess they couldn't have done it because Jacob was still not in a state where... I disagree. He probably, he, he still has the boot on. He probably could have did that. But I think they wanted to have Roman kill them to establish dominance. That he ain't no bitch. He's still Roman Reigns. He's still the tribal chief, the head of the table. And that's fine. So I'm, I'm okay with what they did here. It's fine. Like overall, long term, it made the most sense. I'm just very curious to see where the rest of this goes. Because if the plan, again, if the plan is rocking Roman... Certain things have to start falling into place within the next few months. So we'll see what they do. Yeah, um, I don't think there's anything else to talk about when it comes to SmackDown. Let me be sure I didn't miss anything. Uh, I think I covered pretty much all the things that I missed. So we're going to go ahead and end it here. Thank you all so much for watching my review of Friday Night SmackDown. As you follow out, do all the YouTube things. Like the video, subscribe, and click that bell to catch all my content when it comes out. Follow me on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and donate using PayPal, Patreon, Cash, and Venmo. Now, as I said, starting next week, we're back to live streams. So be sure you don't miss that. Uh, but we're also going to be trying different things with the channel. Um, I've decided for the rest of... Mm, for the rest of the year... Just to see how this works, I'm not going to do intros. You kind of noticed that I didn't do the, when you're in my world. that's gone. For now, I want to see what happens to my viewership. Now that, you know, the algorithm with YouTube has changed, um, apparently now engagement is very important. So I'm going to see if I can just do a video, upload it with no outro, no intro, and see what that does with the views. And if it ends up not changing much, I'll happily bring back the intros, but... For right now, we're going to do no intros for the rest of the year, and then we'll bring those back around WrestleMania season just to see what it does for the channel. Hopefully, you guys are okay with that. Um, but in the meantime, still, give me your thoughts. Continue to watch the videos, like the videos, and if you ever feel like you want something added or you want to express your opinions, always know I'm going to be reading what you have to say. So thank you for watching, and I'll catch you guys next time right here in Alex's World. The place it is, was, and forever will be a safe space for wrestling fans like you. I'm out of here. Peace.